Yesterday, we had a very intense day, but enjoyable, privilege. We listened 100 presentations in this very challenging format, three minutes, about scientific breakthrough ideas, about innovative concepts, by passionate, convinced and convincing, inspired and inspiring young scientists and innovators from all over the world. After that, a tough task for the distinguished jury to select three laureates after an argued debate. Today, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin War. This summer in July, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of a giant leap for humanity the first human landing on the surface of the moon. Yesterday, you discussed intensively in the falling world circle, moonshot for the future. So you were really right to follow the powerful sentence of Oscar Wilde, shoot for the moon, even if you miss you land among the stars. So today, I'm really so pleased to introduce under the spotlights our three shining, rising stars, the explorers of desirable future, the winners of the falling world laps. On the third place, Roshab Sheda from India. Second place, Marielle Van Kutten, and in the first place, respire. And the floor is there. Affordable housing and waste plastic. Rushab Cheda, Falling Walls Lab, Delft. One of the biggest challenges facing climate change and global poverty is indifference. I'm an architect from Mumbai, a city of over 24 million people, and around half of Mumbai's population currently lives in slums. Unfortunately, these unsafe houses and poor living conditions are the only affordable option for a billion people worldwide today. And we could see this number rise to two billion in the next two to three decades. Another issue that poses a threat to almost everyone on this planet is our waste plastic problem. And to give you all the big picture, out of all the plastic that has ever been produced since the 1950s, 79% of it, of 5 billion tons, has either been landfilled or leaked into our environments. And with our annual plastic production expected to grow to almost three times the current rate, which would be a billion tons per year by 2050, it is only getting worse. What if I told you that we could solve these two problems with a single localized solution that has a high social, economic, and ecological impact? The project that I have been working on is called Unibrick. And the idea is to recycle local waste plastic to create interlocking building blocks, like giant blocks of Lego, to empower communities worldwide to build their own houses. These blocks can be simply stacked together in different ways to make an entire house. The wall is held in place using an anchor tie down system, which basically means putting rods through the entire wall until the foundation at regular intervals and bolting them at each end. This system provides some flexibility to the structure, also improving its resistance to earthquakes. The bricks are more insulating than clay, can be made fire resistant, and strong enough to build up to two, 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 three, four, two to three floors high. Mumbai, like cities in most developing countries, has a thriving army of local informal waste recyclers who collect, sort, and sell all types of recyclables. And these recyclers are a very vital part of the local waste management system. So the strategy would be to create a decentralized circular system where with the help of these recyclers, we could collect the plastic from source, which can then be used to locally produce these bricks. A family of four adults can build a house of 50 meters square within a few weeks using the system recycling ap approximately six tons of waste plastic and saving up to 30% in construction costs. 
This project is about helping people help themselves with the broader goal of reducing our environmental pollution. And while most architects happen to work for the richest 1% of the population, I think it's time to focus on the other 99%. Thank you. Breaking the wall of unlabeled data. Marielle van Kouten, Falling Walls Lab, Switzerland. I'm going to give you a head start because, to be honest, I tried this quite a bit on several people, and nine out of ten stare at me when I'm done. Not in a good way, right? They blankly stare. And then a little miracle happens inside their head. They say, ah, it's like the Tinder of science. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Let's try this on you. If I would put a tiny piece of myself in a machine that reads biological information, this is what it would look like. This is complex, large-scale data, and it's generally not considered to be sexy. If you think it is, come see me afterwards. <laughs> there are clues in this data that help us to predict, prevent, and cure disease. In the example, this specific person is prone to develop lung cancer. We can find these clues with the computer. First, you need to tell the computer what to look for, though. And for that, you need reference data that is labeled. Just think about it. You know what a giraffe looks like because someone told you a couple of times. The computer needs a whole lot more giraffes to get the point, and that's a problem. For a given scientist, labeling is laborious and repetitive. And hold on, think about what it would mean for a patient if I would interpret something as different that's actually the same. All right, so let's label data together, right? Actually, I'm pretty sure you've done this before. Remember those CAPTCHA prompts where you try to click all the traffic lights? Did you realize that you're putting a label on data and that those labels are then used to train a computer? Problem number two. Complex, large-scale data is very far off from anything that looks like a traffic light or a giraffe. The dedicated app SciSwipe help scientists in the processing of complex data to swipeable images and distribute these images to the public. Now, these are some sexy curves, right? Every single person in this room, you, can help train a computer by swiping a small number of such images on a smartphone. The combination of these small efforts has gigantic implications because a trained computer can mine infinite amounts of data for clues to predict prevent, and cure disease. SciSwipe is set to revolutionize how academia moves forward with the mining of complex, large-scale data, and how the scientific community involves the public at base level to improve human health. SciSwipe, make it sexy and bring in the crowd. Thank you for your attention. Breaking the wall of broken glass. Rhys Purry, Falling Walls Lab, Australia. We tend to think about glass as the good guy of the packaging world, and that's why we use it for all the important things like beer, wine, and luxury water. Kudos to the organizers for providing my props again. And there's a good reason we think about it as the good guy of the packaging world. Sure, it takes a lot of energy to make it in the first place, but once it's made, it's in theory infinitely recyclable and compared to plastics, relatively non-polluting. But it's a big problem with glass because you can only make white glass from white glass or green glass from green glass. And when we smash it into small pieces, they can't be sorted into the right color anymore, something our supply chain's exceptional at doing, then it loses its value. And this loss of value is a big reason why more than half of all glass is not recycled. So that's more than 60 million tonnes a year, enough to build a wall roughly a metre high, a metre wide, and 40,000 kilometres long all the way around the equator. So now, hopefully everyone's suitably depressed, what's the big idea? Well, when you look at the glass supply chain, 
We've got the raw materials at the top, energy goes in, it's made into bottles, which are recycled or not. It's remarkably similar to a chemical called sodium silicate. Sodium silicate is one of the most widely used industrial chemicals in the world. We consume about 10 million tonnes of it a year, and that market's worth about $10 billion. It's used to make thousands of consumer goods, everything from tyres, detergents, silica gel, and even toothpaste. And the big difference is that there's calcium in glass, and there's none in sodium silicate. So calcium's actually what makes glass insoluble in water. Without it, bottles would dissolve in their own contents. You can probably see where this is going. For my PhD, I've been working on a process that connects these two supply chains. We take glass, dissolve it in alkaline solution, and we can extract sodium silicate and a sol solid intermediate from which we can extract silica gel. And through 4,000 hours of optimization, I've been able to identify the reaction parameters where this proceeds in a commercially relevant way. And I have to tell you, that's on the level of fun, somewhere between watching paint dry and putting shoes on caterpillars. <laughs> but by going through that optimization, we've managed to identify those parameters and patent them, and we're now going through the commercialization process. And that's what really excites me, because the key to creating circular economies is allowing societal and economic outcomes. And when we take glass, which is currently going to landfill, it has a negative value. When we turn it into silica gel, it's worth more than $1,000 a tonne. And because we take the energy that went into glass in the first place, we can make uh, sodium silicate at 50% of the cost of conventional production routes. Thank you.